bookseller crow almost live. Yes. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure to to um, to welcome Abir here to this evening. Um, it's not the first time we met. We we met when he came round with uh, a proof of a rising man. Um, how long ago was that? That was six and a half years ago. Was it five and a half years? Six and a half years ago. Six and a half years ago. And. Uh, you know that was a pre-publication proof, and he was he was trying to persuade me to. Yeah. To and you said, "Don't darken my door again." Is that, is that yeah, what I, I, no? I think we went for a pint. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> um, Abir has won the Crime Writers Association Historical Dagger. He's been shortlisted for the Thixon's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year, and the Times named Smoke and Ashes his third book in the series of Wyndham and Banerjee um, as one of the best crime and thrill crime and thrillers since 1945. Ooh, yeah. so I am that old. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty uh, impressive. Um, so I was going to ask him to read a bit to us first and then we'll have some more questions if that's all right. Absolutely yeah. yeah if that's all right with the audience yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool well before I read, I just yeah, I'll introduce them. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say it's great to be here, and thank you, thank you for inviting me to Crystal Palace. You guys, you guys had a good result at the weekend, didn't you, in football? Yeah, yeah. You're doing all right for for a rubbish team. You're doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> not as well as we are. West Ham is doing very well. Uh, anyway, yeah. sorry, people, people listening at home, this probably doesn't. Matter. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It really is nice to be amongst real people again. <laughs> Uh, I don't mean I'm just being outside of Surrey, I mean just real people. Um, it's great and um, it's, it's wonderful to be here to talk about the new book. Um, and it's a wee bit different from the others because this is the first time that half of the book is narrated by Surin, uh, or Surendranath, as, as I should call him. But it's a very difficult name to pronounce, so I'll call him Surin. Um, and and the reason behind that was it wasn't my choice; it was his. He kept. He's making all my questions. Oh well, I won't answer. I'll, I'll, I'll go with the reason. Uh, the re no, 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 reason no, no, I had to no, say no. that because no, 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 quite precious with my writing, uh, but page two is where the story really starts. It began with a summons. I'm not going to do the accent, okay? I'm going to just do it in a normal voice. It began with a summons. A flimsy yellow chitty waved in my face by Shombu, a rat-faced peon from the top floor. He was a lackey who considered himself superior to his fellow lackeys in the building on account of his being personal dog's, dog's body for the Bora Sahibs upstairs. If absolute power corrupts absolutely, then Shombu was proof that even a minor dose can prove cor corrosive. <laughs> I should have known the instant I saw his crooked beetle-stained grin that like the gathering of the storm clouds on the southern horizon, the fates were aligning against me. He shambled up to my desk, handed me the note and pointed to the ceiling with one bent finger and both bloodshot eyes. Borusha hebe teke chiti. Quickly I unfolded the slip, then held my breath, an immediate summons to the top floor. Lord Taggart, Commissioner of Police, requested my presence. It was not the first time I had been ordered to his Lordship's office. Over the five preceding years, I had attended his inner sanctum on a dozen occasions or more, but always at the request of Sam or another British officer, always the dutiful subaltern on hand to provide illumination in the face of their ignorance of native matters, or a lightning rod to deflect criticism. This time, however, the missive had been addressed to me and me alone. I placed the chitty carefully within the pages of my notebook and took a breath. The commissioner wished to see me. Did he wish me to lead a case? No Indian detective had ever headed up an inquiry before, not in Calcutta at least. Such an honor would be worthy of even my father's begrudging respect. I dismissed the peon and, after stopping by the mirror in the lavatory to straighten my uniform and run a comb through my un habitually unruly hair, I made my way towards the stairs, my heart hammering within my breast. 
Minutes later, I was being led by Lord Taggart's secretary through the doors of his office. His lordship looked up, gave me a cursory glance as if to make sure I was indeed the correct Indian, then returned to his <laughs> scrutiny of the papers on his desk. Sergeant Banerjee, sit. I did as ordered, and for half a minute more, he continued poring over his documents while I contented myself with staring at the row of brightly colored ribbons on his spotless white tunic. Sam, who had worked for Lord Taggart during the war, had on several occasions had on several alcohol-infused <laughs> occasions, regaled me with tales of his missions for the commissioner. Once or twice, when his mood was particularly effervescent, he would even deign to say something nice about the man. But as I say, it was only once or twice. <laughs> Lord Taggart eventually looked up. I recall the light falling through the French windows and reflecting off the discs of, his, of the spectacles, so that for a moment his, his eyes were hidden and he, with his pale skin and blanched tunic, appeared almost ghost-like. Little did I realize, as he began to speak, that my life was about to be torn apart, his words the fateful first domino in the chain of events which would see me accused of a host of crimes as long as a python's tail. Tell me, Sergeant, what do you know about Farid Gul Mohammed? Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's been a while since I've talked. I bit my tongue twice during that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, as, sorry, as I interrupted you starting to say, it is, it is slightly different in that um, it, it gives a, almost an equal billing to the to your to main characters which none of the most the, the four previous books have all been the motor has, has been Sam really hasn't it and, and Seren has been the, the the kind of sidekick to it but in this one they've, they've, it's very much it's told in alternate chapters and I actually it it, um, it seems almost like a, a, a very pared down book in, in comparison to the other I mean not that that's a bad thing and then and you still got the you know this whole story going through it um, but the, see, there's less subplots I think maybe and there's um, well it, it would be good as Sam is no longer yeah well I'll tell you I'll, I mean I'll tell you how that happened and, and you're right it's it's a different book in that you have two different viewpoints of the same events. Um, and let, let's come to that. I'll tell you a wee bit about the book first. So this book opens in Calcutta in 1923. Um, we're about a year on from Sam being in the foothills of, uh, in, of the Kachar Hills in Assam where he went for his uh, drug rehabilitation program. Um, and 1923 was an odd year in Indian history because the British offered municipal elections. Uh, well, the first thing they did was they locked up Gandhi, which was quite clever. Um, he called off his national strike because some policeman died in a village somewhere, and he took it as um, it, he took it as a crime against humanity because this had happened, and he blamed himself for stirring these passions. So he called off his general strike, and the British said, well, thank you, that was really good of you, and then they put him in prison um, for a good six-year stretch, which is quite clever. And then um, they called municipal elections, not national elections, because we're British, we're not stupid, we're going to have elections for something that doesn't matter. Um, and that had the effect of effectively fracturing Indian unity. So what you had was suddenly the whole country had been united under mm. this freedom struggle under Gandhi, suddenly it fractures into Hindu and Muslim and high caste and low caste and all of the fault lines of Indian society come through again and again on ideological lines as well so you had people who were socialists against landowners and you had all of that um, and that was 1923. Now the book opens in Calcutta um, in the lead up to those elections and there is a lot of what we love to call communal violence, which is a great way of saying people are killing each other because of their religion. Um, and Sam and Surin are tasked with finding out why this violence is occurring. And um, very early on, Surin is called in by the commissioner 
and he's told to tail this Muslim politician who's arriving from Bombay. Um, so Surin starts tailing this guy, and um, before he knows it, he's been knocked out. Uh, he's been, you know, jumped and knocked out. And when he comes to, uh, he wanders into a house and he finds a dead man there, and that man is quite a famous Hindu theologian. So Surin does um, the, the cleverest thing he can think of, which is to destroy the evidence. Uh, but he doesn't get very far and suddenly he's in the frame for this murder. So the, the book revolves around Sam and him trying to you know, effectively get himself out of trouble and that takes them to Bombay. In terms of why I wrote half of it from Surin's perspective, um, for those of you who've read the series today, you'll notice that he's changed um, he's become a bit of a pain in the neck to me. Um, I always knew he would evolve. I knew he started off as the dutiful subaltern in, in awe of Wyndham, who was this ex-Scotland Yard detective who's turned up in Calcutta. His reputation preceded him. Surin, who's a very young man at the time, um, is amazed that he's working with this august Englishman. And then after five years of living in the same house and realising he's with an opium addict who's probably not as bright as he makes out, um, you know, he's, he's, the scales are starting to drop. He still loves Sam, but the system that he works for, he is beginning to see it for what it is. And I think that, that starts in book three with Gandhi's first freedom struggle in 21. We see it in Death in the East where he actually says to Sam, you've never tried to pronounce my name properly. Um, and you know, you've been calling me surrender, not like everybody else, but you're supposed to be my friend. And then in this book, um, he said to me, I, I, you know, I had no, no intention of writing it from Surin's point of view, but he was the one who said, no, I deserve a voice here. Um, and I really couldn't argue. Um, and people say, you know, wh why did you start writing it from the point of view of an Englishman? You are, you know, you're a British Asian, you have, you've come from Scotland. Why have you written it not from the point of view of the Indian? Why have you written it from the point of view of the Englishman? Um, and, and I started the series, um, and the, the simple answer to that was when I started writing, I didn't feel confident enough to write authentically from an Indian Indian's point of view, as opposed to a Scottish Indian's point of view, which I can do all the day. Um, but I did not feel confident that I could do that. Um, I didn't co feel confident in my writing and I didn't feel confident in my knowledge of that half of my culture, for which I blame my parents. Um, <laughs> but, but over time, you know, I think a, a number of things have happened. I, I've grown as a writer, I hope I've grown as a writer. Um, and I, I just felt ready to take this on. But part of the reason it's pared back is because I wanted to do Surin justice and I can't do the whole thing from Surin's point of view. I don't think I ever will. But to get both viewpoints in is almost like having a dual narrative. It's like having a dual plot. Um, there certainly are small subplots. Yeah. There, there are a few, but whereas with the, the you know the, the fourth book death in the east we have two timelines and two very different plots here everything is connected uh, but the real change this time is the fact that we have the indians viewpoint and whilst these two men are friends you know their views on these matters can be very very different because of the position that they're starting from is that, did that answer the question i don't know what the question was <laughs> that answer the question yes I'm going to have some sparkling water. I mean, one of my next questions was going to be, would you write a book that just featured him? Or, or That's a good question. Um, I don't, I've got no, no plans to write a book just from Surin's perspective. Um, but as, we'll, as you'll find out, by the end of this book, I've written myself into a bit of a corner. Uh, and I have to figure out how, how to get out of it because there's a lady sitting in the audience here who's given me a contract for another one. <laughs> so I have to figure out, yeah, so there will be more. Uh, I just have to figure out how to do that. Um, but it's a good problem to have. Can we go, go backwards a bit to um, a, a right, a right when the time when you did visit us for a rising man. When, when we went to the pub, do I still owe you a pint? Is yeah, that you do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know, maybe most people know how you how you actually got your first book published. I think, I think, well, do you know, you know, you do know how I got my first book deal, yeah? Because I'm, I'm a fraud, oh, you no, I'm a fraud, right? I have to tell you this. So most people, right, do things the proper way, they, they <laughs> practice, they write, 
thousands and thousands of words. They send, they, they, you know, they, they go in and they, they contact agents and they query and they you know, submit samples and they get rejections and then it happens for them. Um, I'm very lazy. That's the first thing you need to know. And I, I'm also very, I have a lack of self-confidence as well. So I, I spent 20 years of my life as an accountant. Uh, I see some of you looking towards the door now. You can't, it's locked, isn't it? Yeah, so you can't leave. You have to listen to this. So I, I was an accountant for 20 years. I never wanted to be an accountant. I, I always wanted to be a writer. Um, but my English teacher in sixth year, uh, he was a lovely man. He really was. And he said to me, look, don't do an English degree because you'll end up teaching snotty-nosed kids in a school somewhere. Uh, and so I didn't. Um, but also because, you know, I'm the child of immigrants and um, whilst my father was a writer as well, you know, he, he, the, the idea of writing for a living is not something that ever occurred to him. And it doesn't occur to many, you know, if you, the struggle that they went through was not something that they wanted their children to go through. So, you know, okay, you'd be a writer, but after, after you've got a job, a family, children, <laughs> and grandchildren, you know, so it was always, yeah, you can do it when you've got some time. When everything else is settled, then you can write. Um, and when you're sort of 17, 18, that sounds sensible. Um, and so I, I went and did economics at university, and then I became an accountant. And, and it, was, it, was, it was great. I mean, when I said I was an accountant, I had... I was doing mergers and acquisitions, so I got to travel the world and live in fancy hotels and stuff. But as the years went on, I I just didn't I didn't enjoy it at all. I was making rich people richer, um, and you know by this point, twenty years in, I was really you know my my job was not fulfilling, and I tried to start writing. I, I'd started on a number of occasions. Whenever my job was really bad, I did two things. I bought lottery tickets and I started writing a book. <laughs> and then for whatever reason, maybe it would, you know, either my job got better or I got too busy, or I made the mistake of reading the words in front of me. You know, never read, if you're in the middle of something, never read what you're writing till you've finished it. If you're anything like me, because I would read it and I would get scared. I'd say, this is rubbish. And I just didn't have the confidence. I'd put it in a drawer. And I never went to any sort of classes or anything like that. And, and so for over the space of 20 years, I must have started writing about five times, and I'd write about 5,000 words or 10,000 words, and then I would stop. Um, and maybe that sounds familiar to some people. And then this time I was 39 and three quarters. I was hurtling <laughs> towards 40, literally three months away, and I saw Lee Child on breakfast TV. I should have been at work, I was already late, but I saw Lee Child on the, the, uh, on the TV. And he said how at the age of 40 he'd lost his job and he started writing. And I thought, that's a sign, you know, I'm late for work, I'm three months away. So I thought, that's interesting. I went out, I'd never read any of his work before, and I went out and I bought the first novel uh, that he'd written, Killing Floor. And I read it in two days, I'm a slow reader, but it kept, just kept me going, you know, turning the pages. And two things struck me about it. First thing was, the ending was brilliant. It was so simplistic, but it was brilliant. It's the sort of thing you think, why didn't I think of that? Um, and the second thing was the writing felt really simple. It felt really simply written. Um, the fact is now, after five years, I realise that it takes so much skill to write as simply as it looks on the page. So, you know, but perversely, at the time, that gave me confidence. So I thought, right, I can, I'm going to start writing. And, and I always thought about sending this British detective to India. Actually, the idea came to me in the sauna in the gym. Um, no, it was the jacuzzi. It came to me in the jacuzzi because um, that's where, you know, when I go to the gym, that's where I spend most of my time. That's why, that's why I look like this rather than a dog. Um, so, but they did. The idea came to me in the jacuzzi at the gym, and the two characters came together, you know, Sam and then Surin, literally seconds later. And, you know, I, I'm a, a big fan of th that part of crime fiction where you have a good person upholding a system they don't believe in. So I grew up on, you know, um, Martin Cruz Smith's Arkady Renko books, Gorky Park. I'm a huge fan of Philip Kerr, who wrote the, the Bernie Gunter novels. Uh, but one of the things that always intrigued me was why do we have British and American writers writing about Nazi Germany or you know, communist Russia? Why are these authors not looking at our own histories? You know, why are we too, why are we always pointing the finger? And part of the answer is, we don't know our history. We weren't taught it. I wasn't taught our history at school. I certainly wasn't taught colonial history. Um, I learned more about German history than I did about ours in the 20s and 30s. And yet I would come home 
and my dad would tell me stuff, and my mum would tell me stuff, or I would learn something at school, I'd come home again, but my dad would go, that's very good, it's wrong, uh, but it's very good. Um, so, and so from very early age, I knew there was another story there, there was a, a different viewpoint, and I wanted to look at this period where the British were in India, and I wasn't coming to it, as so many people do, out of guilt, or out of a desire to criticise. Because I can't, because I am British and I am Indian and I understand that there are different angles to this and how you look at it depends on where you place the lens. And yes, there's a lot of bad, there's also a lot of good. We don't know about the bad, we don't talk about the Bengal famine of 42-43 where three million Bengalis, Indians who were subject to the empire, were starved to death in a man-made famine at the same time that the Holocaust was going on. But it happened, and it happened because Churchill decided it wasn't worth saving them. We don't talk about that. At the same time, one of the questions that fascinated me was, you know, in the, in the 20s and 30s when the world is going mad with, you know, communism and Nazism, where any dissent is met with a gas chamber or a bullet or a gulag, in that environment, the British and the Indians played out the world's first non-violent freedom struggle. And it takes two sides to do that. Not one, it takes both parties to be civilised to do that. And what was it? So the question I always ask was, well, what was it? What was it spe well, it's so special about these two peoples that allowed them to play out that freedom struggle in the environment of that time? So that today we have a statue to Gandhi in the centre of Parliament Square. I mean, that's mental. You, you, go, you go overseas, you go to France, and you tell that story. There's no statue to Ben Bella or Ho Chi Minh in Paris. And yet, in the centre of our democracy, there is a statue to the man who kicked the British out of India. Now, that says something very powerful about British people and Indian people. And that's what I wanted to really explore. And that's why I needed to look at this time in history through the eyes of these two people. I've not got to why I'm a writer now. Yeah, I'm getting to that now. <laughs> you needed to know that, that's the backstory. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a very fancy way of saying, I started writing this crime novel and I wrote 10,000 words. And then I made the mistake of reading those 10,000 words and I thought, this is crap. And I put it in a drawer. Uh, and then the, the third bit of good luck happened, uh, which was I was reading, you know, I just found the papers and there was a competition being run by Harville Secker, who are my publishers, uh, looking for new crime writers. And all they wanted was the first 5,000 pages of a novel and a two-page synopsis on the rest. And obviously, as I've told you, I am lazy. I'd already done the work. I'd like, you know, these 10,000 words in a drawer. So I took the first 5,000, tidied it up, wrote a two-page synopsis saying, yes, this is my, this is the first 5,000 pages of my, uh, words of my novel. And because there was, wasn't much else left. Um, and I sent it away. And then three months later or four months later, I was hoping to get some feedback because I'd never submitted anything before. I was hoping to get some feedback. Uh, and then out of the blue, I get an email saying, congratulations, you've won. And we're going to publish your novel. <laughs> Which was, you know, and I reacted the way a Glaswegian reacts. Whenever he gets good news, I started swearing my head off. And um, my, my colleagues thought I was having a heart attack. I said, no, it's good news. Except I didn't have this novel. I had these extra few, th sorry, sorry, I should say sorry, Liz. For, um, and you were 40 by then? I, this time I was 40. Yes, I was 40 in two months by now. Um, and suddenly I had this new life opening up in front of me, this opportunity that I never thought I would get. Um, and it happened really quickly. And so I went in and, and you know, my editor said, and I said, look, I haven't actually got a book. I've got a few more words. And they said, no, no problem. Um, because the words you've written are very bad. You can fix them. And so I spent the next year writing the first draft of that novel. Um, and then I really learned to write between the first and second drafts of that novel. Because there was so much red ink on that first draft when it came back. Um, I got scared again. I thought, I can't do this. And then I remembered my training as a financier. I responded to a set, I got a seven page editorial letter with all, everything that needed to be done. And I responded with a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and my editor said that nobody had ever done that before. <laughs> but that's how, that's how I dealt with it. And I was like, well, it in improves editorial efficiency by 2%. Um, but that's how I dealt with the fact that I didn't know what I was doing. I was out of my depth and I thought, let me try and 
you know, make sense of this, and, and that's how I responded <laughs> with animation. <laughs> so, so there you are. So if you're ever stuck, PowerPoint. Okay. But so that's how I became a writer. That was, you know, the first book came out in 2016, and uh, it was Times Book of the Month, and it's just been brilliant since then. It's been. Uh, it's been a dream come true, and it's it's a dream come true thanks to good people like yourselves who, who read the books and and follow the books. And you know, my father he didn't live to see the first one come out, but he knew it was coming, and he said to me, "Do you think people are ready to read this?" <laughs> and I, I didn't know the answer then, but I can say to him now, or if he was here, I would tell him, "Yes, I'm, you know, all over the world now people are reading these books, um, and your name's on the first one, Dad." And 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 you know that to me is very gratifying the fact that there are so many people who because of them I've, I have this opportunity to write these books I wouldn't otherwise you know the, you know the, the nice lady in the back row would have said you know what it's not working nobody's reading these and that would have been it but because of you great people uh, I have the chance to write more of these so thank you do you think that there's also a, um, a way in which you tapped into a kind of um, I mean, I've, I've, I've got a, a couple of friends who said, oh, yeah, they're, they're really great. I, I really like that. Kind I've of got gun. a single friend who said that. that. Kind of gung-ho, sort of, you know, that old Britisher kind of, oh, not Biggles, but, you know, yeah. that, that, you know. Do you Flashman, know I mean? the, Flashman. And yeah, stuff. Flash, yeah, yeah. That, that exactly, you yeah. know, which but they couldn't be more. Yeah, they're not, yeah. More different from yeah. Flashman, but it, it just, there's a similar kind of thing in there. there there's in well you've got way. you've got Sam Sam is a is a damaged man and and I wrote him as an anti flashman and an anti gung ho sort of person. He's a survivor of the First World War. He's got terrible PTSD. He's lost his wife in the influenza epidemic at the end of the war. He's lost most of his friends and he ends up taking a job in Calcutta because it's slightly preferable to suicide. Um, only slightly. Um, mm -hmm. I know Ian, you've been there, so you can back me up on this. Um, but um, but to, go, to go back to this point, um, he needed to be of that generation, what I call the first generation of modern men. He's been through the trenches and he's had his eyes open to the fact that his superiors don't know what they're doing. He's less willing to believe what his social betters tell him. Um, in fact, because of his experiences, he's actually, you know, he, he, he rebels against that. He's very contrarian. So if he's told to do something and he doesn't understand why, he will question it. And, and that's why he sees India differently from 95% of other colonial officers that are there at the time. Um, and I needed him to do that because I needed him to reflect... You know, and this is the, the conceit at the heart of most of historical crime fiction. The, the character at the centre of it is not of that time. He's actually a person out of time. Because that person upholds our values. And he's, he's holding up a mirror to that society and our own. If I was to write Sam as a typical colonial officer, he'd probably be a racist... Um, <coughs> misogynist, you know, um, you know, bigot. Flashman. <laughs> and that market was already taken. No. Um, but that's, you know, that's not the character that I wanted to write. And that wasn't the only type that was there. We know this because, you know, George Orwell wrote a book called Burn Me's Days, which to me is the quintessential book of empire. And he, he gives the lie to the fact that all these colonial officers thought they were doing the right thing. I'm sure a lot of people did. You know, there's a lot of racists amongst them. But there were, there were people, there were people who realised that, you know what, this mission that we've been tasked with, this civilising mission, is a load of um, bullshit. I can say that, you can beep it out on the, 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 the YouTube. But it is, and, and so many people saw through that. Um, and so I think it's, it's as much me telling their story as it is me telling the Indians' story. Um, the first book in the series, A Rising Man, deals with this issue of how do how do the British justify to themselves, how does a moral Christian nation justify to themselves the oppression of another race? And the answer of that to that was moral supremacy. We we had we, we sold not just ourselves, and I'm wearing my British hat here, yeah. depending on who's playing football, I can change very quickly. Um, we sold to ourselves and to the Indians this idea that we were morally superior. And the empire depended on that more than it depended on people. It was that idea, that idea of moral superiority is what 
fueled the empire to the extent that even though the British left in 1947, that attitude that the British are somehow better or that the Westerners are somehow better persisted in India throughout you know, the majority of Indians until the 1990s and, and economic liberalisation. It's only been in the last 20, 30 years that I think Indians fully believe that they can stand on the world stage. And that, I think, is the legacy of empire. It was 50 years in which India felt it had to economically shield itself from the outside world. I mean, it was 50 years that were lost, but they were lost because, I believe, of this mentality that we were so good at, you know, enforcing on them and ourselves. They can find you a book for your girlfriend your husband, your girl, or your boy. And if you've got a need for an uplifting meet, Justine and Jonathan can pick out a book you'll enjoy. What a book at the bookseller Crow on the Hill. What a book, what a book at the bookseller Crow on the Hill. Hill has. But you can order online. <laughs> <laughs>